Hi, this is Jerry Boyer. Welcome to Meeting of Minds with Jerry Boyer. My guest today is my friend Gary DeMar. Gary is the founder of American Vision, which is a Christian research and publishing think tank organization, um, and uh, uh, an old friend of mine going back, wow, I'll, quite a long time. Yeah, really. We yeah. <laughs> so we, I don't know, did we first meet at, when you were at uh, WRD? Is that? Yeah, probably. Right, so we're, we're both Pittsburghers, and one of the reasons I'm here is because I'm uh, I've I actually grew up in the Pittsburgh area, and so we have kind of the same type of uh, interest in the Pittsburgh area. That's uh, probably early '90s, if memory serves me correctly, and even before that, I was reading your God and Government series, etc., and um, material about uh, the Christian origin of the United States. But I wanted to talk today about what you have sort of coming out of your organization now, which is you're finishing up or have just finished a trilogy about Christian apologetics, which is reprinting the work, uh, apologetics works of uh, Dr. Greg Bonson. Can you tell us something about that? Uh, uh, Greg Bonson was a professor at Reformed Theological Seminary in the, in the 70s. I was a student at RTS um, and got to know Greg uh, Dr. Bonson, uh, we we got to know one another as a result of uh, some controversy at the seminary. I was on the student council uh, and wanted to hear Greg's side of the story related to uh, what was happening at the seminary at that time. But as a result of that, we became pretty good friends. And actually, we're really only a couple years uh, apart in in age. At, and um, I think I think Greg was born in 1948. I was born in 1950. And uh, Greg taught in the area of apologetics and ethics at Reformed Theological Seminary. And when Greg left the seminary uh, at American Vision, one of the things that we wanted to do was to train high school and college students in Christian worldview. And I wanted uh, Greg to be the anchor speaker for this week-long conference that we held first at the University of Alabama. This was in the mid mid nineties, and then we held uh, two of them at Oglethorpe University in the Atlanta area. We had like hundred and twenty high school and college students that would that would come. Hmm. And Greg did um, a series of lectures, uh, I think twelve lectures over the over the week, dealing with apologetics, laying out a presuppositional model of apologetics, and the first. First series that he did uh, was called Pushing, well, we called it Pushing the Antithesis. It was Greg's apologetic method to show that unbelieving thought, when pushed to its logical conclusion, cannot sustain itself, and it uses borrowed capital from the Christian worldview in order to, main, to maintain itself. And that book did really, really well. It was, a, it was a great introduction to Christian apologetics, and it was a study guide that went along with it, and uh, study questions, answers to the study questions. So if you wanted a really deep dive into presuppositional apologetics, but introductory, because this was high school and college students, this was the place to, place to start. Always Ready was also a book that came out based upon some lectures that Greg had done, and, and some of those... Um, some of the chapters in there are came from articles that he wrote for our magazine, Biblical Worldview Magazine. And I just came across kind of the brainstorm of I was listening to the the second series of Greg. Greg did three years at these life preparation conferences, and I was listening to the second series that he had done, and I to kind of refresh my introduction to presuppositional apologetics. And I thought, you know, this would make a great series to kind of back up the push you know uh, pushing the antithesis book so I had him transcribed had him edited and we we came out uh, with a a, a a second second volume and then I remember we had a third third series of lectures that Greg had had done and we did the the same thing with it it's it's called the impossibility of the contrary so we have a trilogy of apologetic methodology done by Dr. Greg Bonson for high school and college students. And the nice thing about this is, you know, you, you know Greg could sit down with a, with a high-level philosopher and deal with philosophy and apologetics, and uh, he, he, he just knew it. He knew His every, doctorate was in philosophy, right? Yeah, he had a doctorate in philosophy. In analytical philosophy. Yeah. So I mean, the hard stuff— 
Yeah, you know, v- very hard stuff. Right, yeah, symbolic I, logic uh, and all the rest of it. Right? It's, it was it was a remarkable, remarkable mind. Uh, right. It was. He was so so quick on his on his feet. If you've ever, uh, those of you who haven't um, uh, listened to the debate that he did with Gordon Stein, just called the Great Debate. Uh, it was amazing. The, he, de- he just devastated him. I know. This, right. There's the, the one section in there where uh, Gordon Stein kind of walks into this checkmate move, and I don't understand why he didn't see it coming. Uh, but Greg just just devastated him on this the very nature of you know those things which aren't physical don't exist and then right. Greg asks him the question well isn't the, the laws of logic they they don't have any physical substance to them and yet you you believe in them. it was it was a devastating critique I right. have a in, in pushing the antithesis and the introduction to it I, I, I mentioned that particular exchange. So we so just just to make this clear, because not every probably no one right now, or very few people who are listening to us have listened to that. That the, the, this atheist was denying the existence of anything other than physical reality, right? And challenged Bonson. Well, what exists that isn't physical reality? Is the laws of logic. Laws of logic, and it was. Right? The, it and was, if you and and what's he going to say? The laws of logic don't exist. Yeah. Is he going to use the laws of logic? To prove that the laws of logic don't exist. Oh yeah, it was. It was. I mean, it was a checkmate. All right. all all positions. He was. There was nothing he could say about it. And it was right. an interesting thing about the debate. You you're not supposed to applaud in debates. Yeah. You're not supposed to moan or groan or anything like that. And right. David David Hagopian, who was a very good debater himself, was mm-hmm. the moderator of this debate. And the the the, the crowd just. Erupted right. in laughter by you know what Greg had said when he said, "Yeah, the laws of logic—they don't have any physical substance to them, and yet they exist, and you're using those laws of logic." Yes, and, uh, and David Hagopian is trying to get the crowd under control <laughs> as a result of this. It's really quite a moment. It's unfortunate that the debate wasn't video videotaped, but uh, and, and what's in, what's interesting about this is that. <clears throat> Uh, speaking with David Hagopian a number of years later, uh, uh, Darren Doan, filmmaker Darren Doan, we were, we thought about we wanted to redo the debate. We mm. wanted to hire some actors mm. to uh, to redo the debate. We had all the dialogue and so forth, and then we came up with something else, and it was a debate which is it's under the title Collision with uh, oh Doug Wilson, Doug Wilson and uh, and, uh, late, and Christopher Hitchens. Christopher Hitchens, right. Um, so that grew that grew out of the the debate that that Bonson had with with, uh, with Gordon that. Stein. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That w- really, I don't think there was a better guy to debate Christopher Hitchens than Doug Wilson because it wasn't. Uh, it was done over like four or five days in, v- in various parts of the uh, of, of the eastern part of the United States and v- different venues. One was at Westminster Theological Seminary. Sometimes they were in a bar somewhere. Mm. Uh, it was it was a, just a completely different approach to apologetic methodology, uh, but it was presuppositional. It was basically taking you know the, the Bonson you know Van Til perspective on on apologetics and uh, a, applying it to a very brilliant man. I and mean, Christopher Hitchens well, was let's no stop dummy. for a second because yeah. we're in a certain world and not everyone's okay. in there. So presuppositional apologetics. Uh, yeah, uh, there, there are different approaches to apologetics. Uh, one is, you know, you lay out all the evidences, p- p- present all the evidences that you can for a particular position. Neutrally. N- neutrally, right. The, the evidences uh, the, themselves are what are neutral. And if you just pile on enough of those, those, uh, those evidences, people say, oh, now I believe. Now, you know, sometimes evidence... Does in fact move people to that to a particular position? A presuppositional approach is is getting to the fundamental principles that are being used to argue the case. What are you, what is what are you bringing to the debate in terms of first principles to determine if something is a fact or not? Um, and you know the the uh, unbeliever is going to use reason and he's going to use logic and he's going to presuppose those things are true autonomous reason uh, yes right. yeah we, we you know christians believe that reason in, is in fact a re- reflection of, of 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 god's own character god's own mind and it's and it's not that the presuppo- the christian presuppositionalist denies the fact that there's reason and logic the question is how does one account for those given a position that's a, a matter material based position how do you account for the existence of reason and logic 
the ability to, to, to analyze something within a system that evolved over a long period of time and has no, in, no basis in, in, in terms of its philosophical support. So when the theist is debating with the atheist, um, a, th- a presuppositionalist would say, that for the atheist to come forward and say, okay, we're going to use the laws of reason and the laws of evidence, you know, because those are neutral. Um, and then we're going to start from there, and then you can bring your God claims before right. me. That a presuppositionalist, a presuppositionalist would say that the Christian has already conceded, has already been too generous to the atheist in allowing them an appeal to reason given the fact that their philosophy of ultimate chaos can't account for reason in the first place. Um, they can't even get started. So to basically treat them as though this is kind of equal players and they can appeal to mind and they can appeal to the laws of logic and they can appeal to the laws of mathematics and sensory and all the rest of that, when their system is destruct, when their presuppositions can't adequately support that, is to give them already too much credit yeah. from the beginning. Yeah. And it was the same thing in terms of moral arguments. When Greg Bonson deb- uh, debated um, Eddie Tabosh, uh, Tabosh's, I think, grandparents were involved, were, were, were killed in the, in the Holocaust. And Tabosh brought that up, and, and, and Greg would say, look, I can account for the horrors of the Holocaust Giving my operating assumptions of God and, and and morality and so forth account for it in terms of morally yeah, judge it. Right? This, yeah. this I, was, I can the, condemn it. Yeah, I, I can condemn it. You can't. Right. And again, what what it, I think what a lot of Christians end up doing over over a period of time, they do concede this neutral ground idea. Mm-hmm. Well, Christian presuppositionalists would would not do that. They one has to account for morality on the what basis is something moral evolutionary theory we we got here by uh, by the by the strong killing off the weak right. why why all of a sudden has that changed today right. why right. is it wrong now for the for the strong to kill the weak based upon your operating assumptions how how does one do that well greg bonson was the master of this and those three books that we've that we put together lays these out lays these basic principles out in such a way and you know to get back to the original point while while Greg could sit down with the with anybody in the in the philosophical field of 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 his day what he was able to do is to bring these these fundamental principles down in such a way and illustrate them over and over and over again in practical ways so people could use them hmm. one of the th- one of the things that i think we're seeing in our own time is that history is catching up with the insights of presuppositionalists in the sense that when Van Til's writing about this stuff in the 20s and 30s, and then Bonson's writing about this stuff, I guess, what, like in the 70s? Um, 70s and 80s. 70s and 80s, right? There was still enough borrowed Christian right. capital yeah. that you know there were appeals to reason and to morality that were held in common. Now, the presuppositionalists would say well, they might be held in common, but they're only held in common, Mister Atheist, because you're not being consistent with your own presuppositions. If these really, uh, you you have to ignore your basic worldview in order to have this common ground with us. But what's happened now and is accelerating on a daily basis is the common ground is disappearing. In that the the antithesis, as I think Bonson would put it, is getting pushed further. Yeah, the people they're becoming more and more consistent with with their operating assumptions. Nobody who spent more than ten minutes on social media can en- can any longer believe that people are neutral and right. that they can be logically right. reasoned into the truth. Right. Something else is driving the train in terms of how people look at the world, and that something else is presuppositional and spiritual and emotional, not logical well the, the whole, this the debate with the uh, before the supreme court on uh, the the texas the is it the no it's a miss is it the mississippi, mississippi case yeah, right. uh, the arguments the arguments from from both sides even 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 from uh, those defending the mississippi case was re- you know remarkable to me that wait but th- there is something so fundamental to this particular topic that no one wants to discuss it and you have one of the Supreme Court justices talking about feeling pain. I'm thinking, wait a minute, is that the essence of humanity if you feel pain? I mean, cockroaches probably feel pain. On what basis is there any value to any human being? Something that the Supreme Court today, there is no, there is no discussion of these fundamental first, first principles in order to, to come to these decisions. Right. Well, and that's an interesting point because it's a utilitarian ethic. 
and the, this is the, con- the the conservatives who are essentially representing the Christian Christian constituency are making a pain minimization. You know that's Bentham, utilitarian, right? Um, making an argument. So then, what are we doing then? Then we are weighing the possible pain of the baby off against the lifelong pain of a woman who has a child that she doesn't want and has to bring that child into the world and there's the pain of her lost career and everything. And since we can see her pain and we can't see the baby's pain, then she wins the pain contest, right? But if we say pain is a terrible thing, but pain is not the main thing. If you go if you go two months earlier before the baby's neurons are developed to the point where they can feel the pain, it's still wrong to kill the baby. If you if you pump morphine into that baby where the baby doesn't feel the pain, it's still wrong to kill the baby because God says, "Thou shalt yeah, not murder." Right. Yeah, there's yeah. the operating assumption right there, and the thing what we're 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 debating, we're nibbling around the edges right. with with so much, and it's not just in the area of abortion, but it's dealing with your your specialty economics. Everything gets back to these operating assumptions that are, are kind of lost in terms of what's taking pay, place politically today. Uh, you know, no one wants to say, "Well, that's stealing." Hmm. Even if by majority vote you get you get an, enough politicians to take money from some people to give it to other people, we just want to say it's going to hurt growth output, which it will. It will, but that's sure. not that's not the main issue. I know. Yeah. I know. It's it's hard it's hard to get back to say that this there's there's a moral right and wrong to this because you're right. We have there there really was a lot of. Um, uh, a common belief system. You can see it written into the Declaration of Independence that we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. Right. Pretty much everybody believed that. They're really among the founders. There really weren't any atheists among the founders. Even Thomas Paine wasn't even wasn't an atheist per se. Right. Uh, although he was described as a filthy atheist. Uh, but that was the point, though. You could. Still, and that's later pain. Yeah, that's age of yes. age of reason pain. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, common sense. It's amazing. You read, you read, he paints com- common sense. The number of times he he's, he quotes the Bible yes. in order to make his case. Right, right. Uh, but you know, Darwin comes along, eighteen fifty nine. Everything everything changes. Now, how do you, how do you argue on first moral principles anymore? That's right. th- that is the key to uh, the the presuppositional model of apologetics. Um, and I think it's trans- transformative, and you don't have to be, you don't have to be a an expert in apologetics to actually use it. When I first became a Christian in about 1973, uh, one of the first books I picked up was Mere Christianity. One of the second books I picked up was Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Hmm. And Evidence Demands a Verdict is a thick book. Right. Did, did it mean that I had to go through every single one of those arguments in order to make my case for a belief in God? And I always loved apologetics, and I always liked the specifics of it, and I liked the ev- evidentiary nature of apologetics. But when I began to realize the presuppositional model, now I began to see how the evidences work with presuppositions. Right. One can account for the resurrection of Jesus if one begins with a presupposition that God can raise the dead. Right. If God can create, you know, a man from the dust of the ground, he can certainly raise you know somebody from the dead who's pretty much still intact. Right. Uh, so that 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 presuppositional approach, that first principle approach, makes makes all the difference in the world. You get right to the heart of of, of the issue. Uh, I remember I was in Texas. My brother was going through a divorce, and he was in a court case. And I went down with some. Um, Oh, some moral support, and then uh, he had a lawyer with him, and my brother was trying to explain to him, to his lawyer, what I did for a living, which is kind of hard, hard thing to do. Right. And my my brother said, well, he deals with you know religion and so forth and so on. And he said, uh, as we got into the elevator, he said, no, do you believe in hell? And so by the time we got from the third floor to the first floor, the question is, that's not the ultimate question. The ultimate question is, what is the basis for that belief? So within 15 seconds, I was able to get to the heart of the matter rather than trying to argue on the basis, does hell exist? I said, okay, what? How would you know whether yeah, hell exists or not? How would you not? know it did or didn't right. exist? Right. And, it, and so here's a lawyer. You know, I'm, I'm no lawyer, but that's that stumped him. That was, But right. that was the fundamental issue that got into the discussion about 
what foundational principles are you using, true fundamental principles are you using in order to account for the world in which you live in? Right. So bottom line, Christians need to uncover the presuppositions of those they're dealing with right. in the public sphere, but also be honest about our presuppositions, because they already know we have presuppositions, right? So it's like, yeah, we yeah, do. They're being, so yeah, do they're, yeah, they're claiming to be neutral while right. we have well, presuppositions. We, we have beliefs, and they're just neutral. Right, right. right? And, and no, no. They, they're not neutral, not close to it. Um, and when you actually make them lay out their presuppositions, what Bonson in the book and going back to Van Til show is that they can't really get started. I mean, it's not an argument that ends with them losing. It's an argument they can't even really start. Yeah. And, you know, one of the, one of the interesting things about arguing with an atheist that way, they'll say, well, everybody knows that's true, or everybody knows that's right, or everybody knows that's wrong. And the, the, point, of the point is that not everyone, in fact, does. Right. That's right. Great thing to end on. Gary DeMar, thanks so much for being Thank with you. us. Thank you. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and give it a rating on Apple Podcasts and improve our national conversation by sharing it with some friends.